Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sister. This afternoon, we or is this still morning? Hello, sister. We are going to just hello, sister. Yes. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Is being... Yes, please. The class is being controlled, so you'll be using the chat and then the participation uh, in the in the Zoom. So please, you beg. Say so the class is being what? The class is being controlled. You say what? Hello, sister. The class is being controlled. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So you be using. I can't hear you well. Sister, please, I was saying that the class is under control, so you'll be using the chat more often. So we beg you, be reading the chat for us. And if you ask a question, please be observing the participation, the participants for us, because you'll be raising our hands over there. Thank you. Okay. So when a question is asked, whoever wants to answer should raise, indicate by raise of hand. And then um, um, the person controlling the class will ask, will unmute you. So we are going to, our discussion is abnormal pregnancy. And talking about abnormal pregnancy, we are concerned with every last semester you discussed normal. So with abnormal pregnancy, we are concerned with anything that deviates from the normal. We are looking out to have skills to be able to recognize and to handle whatever deviates from the normal. And for this, it is important to identify as a midwife, you need to know when pregnancy is moving away from the normal. You need to know what to do in order to ensure that that condition is not detrimental to mother or to the child. And we are going to discuss this condition under the following. You have ectopic pregn um, pregnancy. Implantation permit me to say that Implantation bleeding is nothing abnormal, but it is important to discuss it here because people may not know and they could come to you, particularly those that are anxious for pregnancy. When there's station bleeding, they may think there is a challenge. And um, as we go forward, we will talk about incidental bleeding, we will also talk about bleeding in late pregnancy. Now, um, abnormal pregnancy also falls under, I mean, sorry, multiple pregnancy also falls under this because it is, even though everything in it, because the baby's coming two or three at the same time. And then you have medical conditions which are associated 
with uh, pregnancy. These medical conditions complicate pregnancy, like hyperemesis gravidarum, anemia in pregnancy, diabetes mellitus, pyelonephritis, which is usually common, and then the IPT, the INT, the pneumonia, thyroid toxicosis affects pregnancy, and of course, heart failure. So we, before we go to anything, I want us to know that implantation bleeding is not a problem. Implantation bleeding comes up as a result of the morula seeking a comfortable place in the uterine cavity. What is the zygote, if you like? When an ovum, a ripe ovum is released, this is by way of reading our memories. There, through the infundibulum into the fallopian tube, finds its way to the ampulla, the widest part of the fallopian tube. And then the, over, uh, the, the sperm is released by ejaculation. And when this sperm finds its way at the right time to the right ovum, a union takes place. And that union is called fertilization. As soon as fertilization takes place, that zygote begin to divide and redivide and redivide. It is called the morula. That morula travels from the fallopian tube a place that's there boring a hole for them to set the endometrium. So that Please help me pray that network will not disturb us today. Don't be the best. So as I was saying, that uh, space is opened. The corolla settles on it and blood spills out. It is that blood that spills out, that comes out as dots. That's what we call implantation bleeding. Because as the morula sits on the hole that has been kept, uh, done, the, the morula is implanted. That, 
that is what what causes that bleeding. Depending on how early it could come around three weeks, it could drop just the menstrual flow for just half a day or one day. Some people will not understand, they think there is a problem. So having this caused that. Bleeding in early pregnancy. Yes, Hello, Anastasia. Yes, sir, please, we didn't get the explanation to the implantation bridge. Yeah. Allow us to... When fertilization takes place, fertilized ovum and I said this, what do you want? You see, you didn't Are you muted? Okay, I said when the ovum is fertilized and it is it, it, it begins to divide and redivide, it is called the morula. And this morula travels down to the uterine cavity. While in the uterine cavity, the trophoblast, the trophoblastic cells begin to make a hole in the endometrium. And we all know that the trophoblastic cells are in the placenta. So when this hole is made in the endometrium, there is a pool of blood and comes out, call it implantation bleeding. It is like the normal uh, uh, menstrual flow. Somebody comes to you complaining. I have always had a regular period and my flow is usually four days, five days, seven days round. I am spotting. You have to advise her to check herself more. Check her nipples, check the side of her breasts. As, as, times go, as time goes on, confirm that she is. So we are looking at bleeding early pregnancy. And the definition says any vaginal bleeding before the 20th week of gestation. That bleeding is defined as early bleeding or bleeding 
early bleeding in pregnancy. Any kind of provided that pregnancy is under 20 weeks. The possible causes of bleeding in early pregnancy are one, abortion. That pregnancy may be threatened. Two, it could be ectopic. And depending on the size sites of the ectopic, it may have ruptured. And so there is bleeding. Or maybe there is high that deform mold. That is the cause it will bleed. Now, this in early pregnancy are of not related to the pregnancy. Oh, what do I do? If my network is bad, spend your ears. There's nothing I can do with the network. Somebody is complaining that my network is bad. Since we are trying to stay in our ears, but still, we are not hearing anything. It keeps breaking. The bleeding is related to pregnancy. Say what? Hello? Hi, sister. I didn't hear what you said. I didn't get you. I just, Somebody I, has I'm complained that, that my are... network is bad. Yes, you are finding it very difficult to yeah. hear you. I'm, I'm talking on, on top of my voice, so my head is even aching. I don't, it must be work. It must be network. So this explained it to us earlier that this bleeding is small in amount and appears in on the third week, having missed your period. Bleeding occur when fertilized ovum attaches itself to the lining of the endometrium. That is what I have said, and I have told you that before. And then we have associated, we also have a pregnancy that comes up, uh, um, sorry, bleeding that comes up. Uh, during pregnancy, but it's not due to pregnancy itself. The woman is pregnant. That bleeding is not associated with the pregnancy. So you have like the cervical lesions, like ruptured veins. When that one happens, yes, she is pregnant, but it does not have anything to do with pregnancy. You have the cervical erosion there, and then you have the cervical polyps. All these ones may occur during pregnancy, but they have nothing to do with pregnancy. It's about the pathology of uh, bleeding in early pregnancy, the one that is associated with pregnancy. Now you have um, necrotic changes in tissue adjacent to the bleeding. 
then detachment of conceptus. The above will simulate uterine contractions resulting in expulsion. If you look at this diagram here, that is the uterine cavity there. And then you find out that the, there is necrotic change around here. And by reason of that change, if you look here, the space between the cavity and the end, the the in place the conceptus which is this is being detached and then this as it happens it will simulate uterine contractions and once uterine contractions are stimulated, expulsion is taking place. Now, before we come to this, I just want to make a comment. This pathology goes for threatened abortion or induced abortion. For doctors who will induce abortion because the client does not want to keep the pregnancy, when they do this at early periods, they tell you they are not killing, they have not killed they tell you it is a blood mold. But I want to give you food for thought. Somebody comes up 10, 14 days into her amenorrhea. of breast, frequency, of micturation and many things of pregnancy. And the person comes and says, I am feeling this. And the doctor says, oh, here. And contraction starts. Expulsion takes place. That person will say, I didn't kill. I want to ask you one question. Let us liken this amenorrhea to the planting of corn, maize. You have a farm and then you plant your maize and the maize begin to shoot up. Somebody comes and cuts the ears of the maize, uproots it completely. If that maize is allowed to grow, Will it not produce corn? It will produce the same thing with criminal abortion, the same thing with induced abortion. If you allow it to stay, it will go to term. If you claim that it is not a baby, then that woman is not pregnant. So what is she aborting? She comes to the clinic, the doctor says, no, it's not pregnancy. Let me conduct curatage for you. What is he curating? That is food for thought. For those of us that are working with these women and with these doctors, it is real food for thought. So that is uh, bleeding in early pregnancy. Just give me a little while and we will, I will bring up um, incidental bleeding.
of um Vele, Njaba. Si eh o mo ni o ma
Please, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. The network is something else, so we'll move fast. So we say that uh, ectopic pregnancy is one in which this fertilized ovum is implanted and develops outside, outside the endometrial cavity. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, you see the different sides. Hello, yeah. I don't know. Uh huh. That you should tell me. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, looking at the table there, you you can see that the the different sides for ectopic pregnancy are lined up there. Those are the different sites of ectopic pregnancy. The ampulla where fertilization it takes place, the infundibulum, anywhere it hooks, it can hook, even in the ovary, abdominal cavity, everywhere. So those are the different sites. Now, I had to shunt to that so that you will know the different sites where ectopic pregnancy can take place. Now, you see this one here is a, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. If you look, you will see that the right fallopian tube is the one that is affected. And this uh, pregnancy is just five weeks gestation. You can see it there. In the center there, there are blood clots and all that. And so what is the incidence? How rapid is it? The incidence says that it is increased due to PID. And when I use it, is. Oh my God, Louisa, what's the problem? Oh, hello, Louisa, what's the problem? I'm in the office. I'm on campus in my office. But now, as I'm teaching, you people are not hearing. Should I move? Because it has come up. Are you hearing me now or you are not? Hello, yes, class. Can hear you. you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. So, um, it could be due to the use of IUCD, it could be due to tube surgery or and, uh, the, even the assistant uh, reproductive technique that can cause ectopic pregnancies. And then we will have the incidence ranging from one in 25 to one in 250 pregnancies. The average range is one in 1,000 pregnancies. When you give that ratio, we are talking about normal pregnancies. And then it also happens during late marriages, when somebody marries late, when somebody tries to have children late, when you do the assisted uh, reproductive technique, you have 5%. And another shocking thing that we must know is that 
when somebody has had an ectopic pregnancy, it can recall. It can come again. And then the recurrence rate is 15% after the first ectopic and then 25% after two ectopic pregnancies. So you just pray that the ectopic pregnancy does not come at all. Now, what are the factors that are responsible? Salpingitis, previous tubal surgery, zygote abnormalities, that is chromosomal abnormalities, ovarian factors, this can cause uh, uh, ovarian factors. It could be that the ovum enters somewhere that is, is not supposed to go, or uh, uh, there is a problem in the ovary. And then oral contraceptives can also cause that. Endometriitis, IUCDs, we have talked about that. Those could be responsible for this problem. Then the fate of tubal pregnancy. The gestational sac is surrounded by a blood clot and retained, which is usually retained in the tube. When that happens, this may remain for long periods in the tube and it could uh, form things that are called the chronic ectopic pregnancy. Or they may be gradually absorbed. The facts may be, uh, the, 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 the features, the, the blood, the blood mold, the other things could be gradually absorbed into the body. And we say involution, just like involution. Let me not say we say involution, just like involution. And that is usually a problem. It's not the best. Then the tubal abortion, in this case, the other one is tubal mold. You know, when we're talking about uh, 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 causes of early uh, bleeding in early pre pregnancy, is absorbed. And usually when that number one happens, the problem becomes that that patient or that woman may find it difficult to get pregnant again. And then the second one is the tubal abortion, the actual um, ectopic pregnancy. This occurs more if the ovum had been implanted in the ampullary portion of the tubes. Separation of the gestational sac is followed by its expulsion into the peritoneal cavity through the tubal ostium. So when it ruptures, instead of the products going through the, uh, the, the fallopian tube to the uterine cavity, the products are expelled into the peritoneal cavity and it becomes a problem. It, we say rarely re-implantation of conceptus occurs in another abdominal structure. And this leads to secondary abdominal pregnancy. It's not common, but it does happen from time to time where the, the conceptus is implanted somewhere else. And then you have number three, the tubal rupture. We are talking about the feet of tubal pregnancy. The feet could be that it becomes a blood mole and it is absorbed. The feet could be that it is implanted in the tube and it ruptures into the peritoneal cavity. And then the more common one, which is number three, is that implantation could occur in the isthmus. And we know that the isthmus is the narrowest part of the fallopian tube. Rupture may occur in the anti-mesentric border of the tube and is usually profuse. When that rupture occurs, 
the bleeding is usually pro uh, profuse. And where does that bleeding go? It goes into the peritoneal cavity. And that is why it is called intraperitoneal hemorrhage because it goes into the peritoneal cavity. If rupture occurs in the mesenteric border of the tube, the broad ligament uh, hematoma will occur. What we are told here is that we all know where the mesenteric, uh, the mesenteric is. So if this uh, rupture occurs around there, the broad ligament will absorb the, ble the bleeding and we have hematoma. So if you look at the diagram here, you will see that here, that is the infundibulum. And then there is conceptus there. You and I know that it will not go far. Rupture will take place. The same thing here. Rupture will take place. It will not go far. And then presentation, how does it present? Presentation. You have early symptoms, maybe very subtle. It comes up and it is like pregnancy. C clinical presentation of ectopic pregnancy occurs at about seven weeks after the last menstrual period with a range of five to eight weeks. So in between there, that's where you begin to have the problems. That's where the pains, that's where the discomfort will be because it is in the wrong place. We talk about ectopic triad. A triad. What is the triad? My pregnant, my um, menstrual flow has been delayed for about five, six, seven, eight weeks. That is amenorrhea there because it has delayed here. And then I am having so much pain. Suddenly, I noticed that I started bleeding per vagina. That's the triad. You cannot talk about ectopic pregnancy without talking about the triad. First, amenorrhea, second, pain, and third, bleeding. The patient, these are the signs, the patient looks quiet and conscious. But the, 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 uh, the patient perspires a lot and looks blank, looks confused. The patient is pale. Gradually, the patient has features of shock. That is when we talk about features of shock. The bleed, uh, the, the sweating, the perspiration causes cold, clammy skin. Then the abdomen feels tensed. The abdomen is tensed because she is bleeding inside. The abdomen is turbid and tender, but from palpation and in which shifts from side to side. Pelvic examination reveals the uterus is seen to be normal in size, but slightly bulky. Remember that this thing is in the fallopian tube. Tenderness in the phone. On palpation, moves from one side to the other, she will scream. No mass is usually felt through the phonics. This should always be remembered. But the uterus floats as if 
there is fluid inside. And then the symptoms will tell you when that uh, this thing is still unruptured with features suggestive of pregnancy. Uneasiness on one side of the flank, which is continuous or at times colky in nature, very painful. But um, I, well, uh, let me see. Then the uterus is usually soft. Um, is possetile small, a possetile small, well circled. When we talk about something being pulsatile, you touch it, it might pulse it. It pulse it. This may be felt through one phonics separated from these things, these uh, signs, we as midwives may not be able to elicit it, but the doctors will elicit on investigation. Then chronic ectopic. There is amenorrhea, there is lower abdominal pain, there is vaginal bleeding. And then the patient will look ill, very pale, pulse is persistently high, even during rest. The patient presents with features of shock and temperature may be slightly elevated. Then on abdominal examination, tenderness and muscle gauge on the lower abdomen, especially on the affected side. And that tenderness is a striking feature. It is a feature you cannot overlook. There is mass in the lower abdomen And this may be as irregular and uh, why it cannot be regular because you are touching the poles, the, the, the poles, the head, the face, and then the, the trunk, depending on the way it is. It could be where the limbs are, and then the, the bridge, so it cannot be regular. Colon signs, which are usually dark bluish discoloration, could be found. And if it is found, it suggests that that patient is bleeding intraperitoneally. Diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. A pregnancy test is usually positive. You do a hematocrit, you do white blood cells count, and then a negative test does not rule out an ectopic pregnancy. That is a very important thing to note. When you have all these features, and the pregnancy test is negative. That does not mean there is no ectopic pregnancy. It could be that the cause of where it is located, the, the, the hormone has not circulated enough. That could be the reason. And then subacute ectopic pregnancy is still chronic. You have to do blood examination. You have to test um, called synthesis has to be done. You test the uh, beta HCG sonography or sonography. Sorry, has to be done. Color Doppler sonography also must be done to confirm 
than a combination of quantitative beta HCG, which is actually valued and it is done by using the scenography. Paraphoscopy and light. in the tube and also rupture and so you cannot talk about dilatation and curatage you talk about laparotomy because that is when you will be able to see exactly what needs to be seen and repair done if possible management we talk about emergency treatment and what is this emergency treatment you want to treat for shock ensure there is oxygen there is warmth and immediate surgery immediate surgery what do i say immediate surgery surgical treatment topic techniques medical treatment supportive treatments such as antibiotics ion therapy a high protein diet will go a long way to help as midwives our duty is to counsel and accept and unless you know the doctor knows what he is doing don't accept dilatation and curettage in a situation where laparotomy needs to be done. And then if the uh, ectopic is unruptured, expectant management is observation, hoping that there will be spontaneous resolution. And indications for this expectant management or observation are initial serum HCG level is less than 1,000 uh, international units per liter. And the subsequent levels are falling. When they are increasing, you can't subscribe for that. Then gestational sac, uh, uh, sac size is less than four centimeters. No fetal heartbeat. Where there is no fetal heartbeat, and with all these uh, 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 parameters, you can say, okay, and there's no even evidence of bleeding. In other words, there may be no rupture. You may watch. But where you have the obvious signs, bloated abdomen, uh, 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 I mean, gestational sac size, rupture and bleeding, you need to save that life as a matter of urgency. Then conservative management. Conservative management could be medical or surgical. Please always remember that where conservative management is medical, then you know that there is no rupture all the signs are regressing. You can do conservative management. The drugs commonly used for solving uh, for salvingo synthesis are methotrexate, uh, depending on which one your doctors use, and then the potassium chloride. Then you have the prostaglandin, which is usually called PGF and then 2A. Any of these ones 
could be used. But as a midwife, ensure that the condition is such that the child or the woman will not die in your hands. And then the conservative surgical uh, treatment or management, you have they have to do the salvingostomy, which is linear. Then no, the doctor will use a, a linear object to with um, um, with um, a, a salving just to be able to observe what is in the fallopian tube. And segmental section. When we talk about segmental section, the affected seg uh, 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 section is cut. Segmental resection, sorry. The affected section of the fallopian tube of the fallopian tube is cut. They cut it this way, that way, and they mend the fallopian tubes. And then fibril expression. When it happens in the fibril area, they could express it and remove it. And then there's a fingectomy that is opening into the fallopian tube. So you agree with me that where you have to express the fimbrial uh, area, how do you do it? You have to see what you are doing before you can do it effectively. Other sides of tubal pregnancy, I showed you the diagram of the different sides of tubal pregnancy, the peritoneal cavity, and then the cervical pregnancy has also been registered. I cannot remember whether we saw it. The cervical pregnancy. Let's go back to that diagram. Yes, there is a site there in the cervix. The cervical pregnancy at the cervix there, you can see it. So you can see that there are many sites. The isthmus where we talked about, the interstitial area, the intraligamentus, the ampulla, all over the place, you can get it. And then the peritoneal cavity is outside outside the uterine cavity. Okay. <clears throat> Ectopic pregnancy, when you see it, you will see the area, how it is bloated. That is the ectopic pregnancy there. The, the uterus is not bulky, it's as it is. Complications. About one in 100 ectopic pregnancies result in maternal death. So it means maternal death is not common. Third ectopic tubal pregnancy could cause, could result in maternal death. And then the majority of these deaths are preventable. What do we mean? death being prevented. It means that if that situation, yes, Abigail, Abigail African, I have you. Hello. Abigail. Hello, from good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
um, please, um, you've made us understand that um, when the pregnancy occurs in the tube, they do um, salpingectomy to um, remove the pregnancy. What about other um, parts of the uterus, like the cervica? What procedure do they use? Thank you. Come again. And please, I was asking, apart yeah. from the tube, um, I know that they do salpingectomy for the tube. One pregnancy okay. or three day. Uh, so apart from the tube, the other um, sites that pregnancy, okay, like the cervical and other parts, what procedure do they use for that um, surgery? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. You know, the tube is quite delicate. And when it ruptures, there is a problem. But when it comes to other parts, for instance, you talked about the cervix. When it occurs in the cervix, the, um, the myometrium of the cervix is not very thick. You understand? And the endometrium is not very thick. So uh, incision is easily done and that removed. The only problem there will be that there could be a scar which might interfere with cervical dilatation. But this has not been mentioned. In other words, there is not much danger in it. That is my assumption because everywhere you go, they are talking about the tube, the tubal pregnancy, and they only mention other sites. It means that with other sites, they, they are manageable. The problem is usually the tube because when the tube ruptures, that bleeding gets into the peritoneal cavity. But if the cervical ectopic pregnancy has to rupture, you and I agree that the bleeding will just pass through the vagina and come out. And the conceptus too could be expelled more easily. That's why they just mentioned the site and nobody bothers to go in depth. Is that okay? Hello. Am I to continue? Hey, Abigail, you asked a question. I have explained that you are not answering again. Sister, please, you have responded. You say yes, sister. At the chat. Sorry? Her network has taken her away. Now, no, this has just said yes, it's like he's writing it. Okay, she understands. I can't hear you very well. Anastasia, your voice is not clear. Maybe your your mic. Now, chronic self-injuries, chronic self-injuries could result to this condition. And usually it gives rise to infertility or sterility. Interstitial obstruction develops after some time. And apart from the obstruction, you also have, when we talk about the hemoperitoneum, we are talking about blood in the peritoneum. And when you have this, there's bound to be peritonitis. There's bound to be peritonitis. Oh. 
we also talked about gestational trophoblastic disease, GTD. GTD. This is a term commonly applied to spectrum of interrelated diseases originating from placental trophoblast. That is why it is called gestational trophoblastic disease. We all know that trophoblast has to do with the placenta and placenta only comes up during um, pregnancy, during the gestational age. Classification. The conventional histo uh, histological classification of this condition includes number one, high deform mole. High deform mole could be complete or partial. Invasive mold, cardiocarcinoma, and then placental site trophoblastic tumor. What do we understand by placental site trophoblastic tumor? Placenta or trophoblast has to do the are tissues of the placenta. And what this means is that some tissues of the trophoblast of the placenta could begin to outgrow themselves. So that is the classification. And then Um, the World Health Organization classified this condition as either TD4 mole, complete, partial, or invasive. That is, he has brought the invasive to add to the complete and incomplete. And then the placental cytrophoblastic tumor, that is the cario carcinoma, which is usually non-metastatic or metastatic. You and I know that when something is metastatic, it proliferates. And when it is non-metastatic, it does not proliferate. And subjects that are metastatic are usually cancerous. Then you, you still under it, you have the low risk, good prognosis. That is when it is low risk, it has good prognosis. Then the disease presents less than four months duration. Initial serum HCG level is less than 40,000 units. Um, international units. That is 40,000 mil per international unit. Then metastasis is limited to the lungs and the vagina. You don't have a prior uh, chemotherapy. You do not have preceding term delivery. Where there is no, uh, the person has not been subjected to chemotherapy or uh, preceding term delivery, all those things are put under the lower risk. In other words, the prognosis is good. And then the second class, according to World Health Organization, is the high risk. And in this one, the prognosis is poor. The duration, it manifests after four months. It does not manifest early. Initial serum HCG is far more than 40,000 uh, international units per meal. The brain 
and the liver is affected, are affected. And metastasis has even set in. That patient may have been under chemotherapy and then there may be a term pregnancy. So that becomes a real problem there when we talk about hydatidiform mole. So you look at hydatidiform mole, how it looks like. You can see features there. Physically, when you see it, it will look like rice greens. What is supposed to be a pregnancy? So you can look at it critically. Some of you may have been opportuned to see some in the service area. That is it. That is the uterine cavity there. I told you it looks like rice. Look at it there like jello rice. What you are looking at there is the uterine cavity. That is the uterine cavity there. That, that's the hydatidiform mold there, like jello rice. And then that's the uterine wall. Hydatidiform mole is an abnormal condition of the placenta where there are partly degenerative and partly uh, proliferative changes in the young chorionic villi. You all know what a chorionic villi is. A chorionic villi is the part of the, the placenta that is responsible for, uh, that, that takes the nutritive function of the placenta. And when it becomes like this, of what use will that be? Types of hydatidiform mold. You have the complete, you have the incomplete. The incomplete is sometimes called Partial. So, features of partial and complete hydatidiform mold. So, you see here, these features here are for the partial, and the features there, as you can read, are for the complete. Now, you look at the, the features. Most commonly, you have them about 69 XXX and XXY. While this one is XS and XY. Then you have the, the karyotype, the karyotype pathology, the features. In the partial, the karyotype um, pathology, the fetus is often present while in the complete is usually absent. Now, the amnion, the fetal red blood cells could also be present because the fetus is present. Then there's bound to be amnion, there's bound to be fetal red blood cells. Here it is absent, so it cannot be there. And then um, you have the villus, the villus oedema. It is variable and focal. This one is diffuse. When we talk about the villus oedema, villus, the, the villi, the villi are the finger-like um, processes that borrow the ground. The, when I call ground, I'm talking about the endometrium that borrows the endometrium, they swim inside the blood and seep oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. So here, because the fetus is present in the partial, they are focal, 
and they are variable, but they are absent in the complete. Then trophoblastic proliferation, again, focal, again, you have a slight to moderate, while in this one, it is diffuse. You can hardly uh, identify what it is. You come to clinical presentation. Clinical presentation, the diagnosis will tell you it is a missed abortion. While in the complete, they tell you outright it's a molar gestation. The uterine size is small for it. This one, 50% large for it. Teca lutein cyst is rare. Here it is there. You see it present. 25 to 30% large. Medical complications, they are rare here. You could have about 25% of it. And then postmolar uh, CTN, you have it here, 2.5 to 7.5. Here it is larger. So those are the problems where we have. And so why is it necessary to learn this? When a patient presents with this kind of a thing, you will, as a midwife, be able to counsel her. Still continuing, the gestational age for the complete is eight to 16 weeks. While for the partial, 10, it can go 10 to 20 weeks. And then the uterine size, uh, size. large for uh, gestational age is about 33%. That's the, 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 uh, the, the, the gestational, the, uter the uterus just gets enlarged like that. It grows outrageously. Then for the partial is 10%. While small for dates, again, 33%. And then 65%. Diagnosis by ultrason uh, ultrasonography is very common. Once you bring the ultrasound or the ultrasonography, it will depict it immediately. But in the partial, you may not be able to depict it. While the teca lithium cyst is present up to 35% and it is rare. These are the features you come about, uh, you come by when you are talking about high that deform more. Then human chorionic gonadotrophin hormone is, 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 um, is much, much in the, um, Complete, because it is complete, it is more than 50%. While the, sorry, 50,000 per meal, while for the partial is less than 50. But when we talk about 50,000, 50,000 is high. And then malignant potentials, you have 15 to 25% and just 5% in the partial then metastasis less than 5% and less than 1%. As far as I am concerned, once metastasis set in, it is a serious condition. Once metastasis set in. Then incomplete, again, you see what you have seen there, like I told you, it will look, if you see it in the naked eye, it looks like rice balls. Then gross findings. Gross findings include massively enlarged abdomen, endometrous villi that give the classic grip like appearance to the placenta and lack embryonic tissues. 
now. By the time they come to the, I told you it will be like rice grains. But we are told here that the gross findings will be that they look like grapes. And so true, when you look at it, you can see that it looks like grape. Pathological features include hydropic swelling in the majority of the villi. The villi will begin to swell accompanied by a variable degree of trophoblastic proliferation. You see, it, it is very frustrating because the placenta that is supposed to feed the child is the one that is having these features. In other words, that pregnancy is not there. That pregnancy is not there. Then complete hydatidiform mold. The classic snowstorm appearance is usually created by multiple placental vesicles. So you can see the snowstorm appearance. That is because you have multiple placental vesicles. The placental tissue is supposed to be one type that is supposed to feed the baby, take care of the baby. Now it has become vesicles. Then clinical features. There could be vaginal bleeding, varying degrees of lower abdominal pain, constitutional symptoms. Expuls, expulsion of grape-like vesicles per vagina. Once this happens, she comes with a sanitary towel, she, she comes with whatever she is using and shows you this is what I am discharging per vagina. And it looks like this small uh, red uh, Jewish grapes that we eat, then of course you don't need anybody to tell you that it is high that you did for more. In a situation like that, you may ask her because of the size of the abdomen, is there any history of quickening? There cannot be history of quickening because there is no child in there. The features, the features as suggestive of early months of pregnancy, but what is there is not pregnancy. The patient looks ill, that is normal. The patient is pale, features of preeclampsia, hypertension, edema, or peritoneum. Initially, when we started this, I told you earlier that there is usually me, uh, miss, what do we call it? The pregnancy is missed. It starts regressing. And eventually the features are absorbed. And we said it there, it is done like involution. Once that happened, I don't know if you have ever seen it before. I saw a lady and it happened like that and that was the end. She never got pregnant again. She never got pregnant again. And by the time I saw her, it was too late. It had taken a long time about three to four years, she was telling me this story. And I was like, ah, if I had seen her earlier, probably she would have gone to the hospital that early time and curatage is done. Who knows whether something would have come up. That is it. That is it. So we have features of preeclampsia, hypertension, edema. And she even has proteinuria. Per abdomen, the size of the uterus is more than the expected period of amenorrhea. It is bigger. 
the feel of the uterus is firm and elastic. Fetal parts are not present. Fetal heart is not there. Vaginal examination, when you do an internal ballotment, um, when you do a vaginal examination, sorry, an internal ballotment cannot be elicited because there is no fluid inside. Unilateral and bilateral enlargement. You have the tecalutum cyst that we are talking about of the ovary. Enlargement of the ovary. Findings of the vesicle um, in the vaginal discharge. The, the, we, we were told that the, the placental tissues become proliferative and vesicle, vesicle features, we saw it up there. And these features are seen in the vagina as we were told before. So a woman comes and presents with those things. And then the invasive mood. Remember, we are talking about the high dirty form mood, which is complete or incomplete, and then the invasive mood. That is how World Health Organization classified them. Invasive mold is the most common sequela of hydatidi for mold. It represents about 70 to 90% of cases, particularly of persistent GTD. Remember that GTD is gestational trophoblastic disease. The disorder occurs when hydropic chorionic villi are present within the myometrium. Hydropic chorionic villi. They are enlarged. They have something like water inside the villi. And these are present in the myometrium. It's vascular spaces or at distant size uh, 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 sites. So you could see them, they, are, they could be in the vascular species or they could be at distant site, but they are there found in the myometrium. This lesion has been known as karyoedema. Karyoedema. Oh, sorry karyoadenoma, and anything that comes near that side, you know that it is carcinoma in character. Karyoadenoma dystruen. It is cancerous. We are told it is a penetrating mole. It is a malignant mole and a molar this trend. Again, the other one said karyoadenoma distrend. This one says uh, molar distrend. All of them are carcinoma in nature, whatever the Christian name they carry. We are told that up to 20% of invasive moles metastasize. Where do they metastasize to? The metastasize to extrauterine, pelvic, and distant sizes. So they come out of the pelvis, or whatever size they are, they are seen. You have like the lungs, you have like the vagina, you have like the vulva, the broad ligaments. In other words, wherever they are, the they just take, uh, they just begin to migrate and metastasize, they increase in size and they cover up other areas. Malignancy is not the best. As a midwife, you continue begging God. God, I beg you, let malignancy, let me not see it. Remember we were told that by the T-deformed world has a snowstorm appearance and that is it. 
we saw the snowstorm appearance the other way where the uterus was standing up. Here, the, this thing is shown upside down. Do you have questions? GTD is common. GTD is a common feature. If you have not seen it, other people may have seen it. But it is a most disheartening feature because where a woman is thinking she is pregnant, that is where this one will manifest. Hello. I definitely am not in alone in class. Anastasia. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 